It's our privilege as we start 2018, I guess, just to endeavor to see where our lives are going. And God gives us a brand new canvas again. I love the fact that he's outside time and eternity, outside time and and space, and yet he gives you and I calendars and days and weeks that we can gauge our lives by and look uh, forward in our lives to where it's going. And and I love that about God. I love that that he's, uh, he's created a day and called it today, and it's our privilege and pleasure again to enjoy that day in which we live. This is the day that he's made, and we will rejoice. Come on, we will rejoice. Tell your face as well that we will rejoice and we'll be glad in today because he's made it today. We're alive because of his grace. We're enjoying his presence because of his grace. We're here because he's made available for you and me the ability to live another day. And so we're thinking about this next year and where's God's vision for your life? Where's the direction of your life going? What is it that God is taking you? What's occupying your thoughts and your intents and your motives and your actions and your priorities? in your life? Is it the Facebook that you're now scrolling through in the moment as you're in here today? Is it the WhatsApp responses that you're getting that you're looking at right now as you're in here? What is it that's determining your life today? What is it that's going to be going forward? Where are the energies of your life going to go? Where are the choices that you're going to make going to take you this year? Are you going to drift again like you've drifted so many years up to this point? Drifted by the necessities of life and drifted by the social network of which you're part or drifted, drifting because of the friends that you're in, drifting because of the trends in society that take you down a particular way because you have to behave that way and you have to respond that way and you have to live that way because that's what society is telling you how to live at the moment. Is that where you're going to go in 2018? Are you going to just drift along in your life? Or is, could 2018 be the year where God comes into your life in a brand new way and actually you shift according to some godly trends that he wants to put in your life? That your direction would shift because of what God trends in your life or, or what he intends for your life. We've been studying Abraham these last couple of weeks and we're going to continue doing that for just a few weeks to take us into uh, February. And Abraham, at, and where we're going to read today, was 75. He was uh, 75 years old when God shaped, began to reshape his life by putting fresh trends into his life. And I, I would question anybody who's in here today, and you may think, my best is past. I'm now over the hill. My best days are behind me and not the, they're not in front of me. Don't believe that for a moment. I believe it for everyone in here, whether we're 25, 55, 75, our best days are still ahead of us. God has still got some great things ahead. Until he gives you your last breath, your best day continues to be ahead of you. He can accomplish in you in a moment what you've taken a lifetime to try and do. That's our God. And he's got some great days ahead for everyone. Don't let anybody tell you that your best days are not ahead. Because here was Abraham, 75 thinking that I guess my life is just as it is. I've lived in error for all these times. I've made a mistake and ended up halfway uh, on the journey that I'm supposed to go, and I'm settled there. And God comes again in his 75th year and puts a brand new, uh, as it were, trend in his life and says, I'm going to shape you by putting some fresh trends around you that are going to take you in a brand new direction. And that's where we're going to go this morning, because I believe God wants to do that for everyone. He's looking to align you and I. He's looking to take you and I in the direction that he wants you to go. And I love it how God has designed you and I uh, anatomically and physiologically that we always move forward. You're designed to move forward. Your legs and the joints in your legs are designed to take you forward. They're not designed to take you backward. I know there's very talented people in here who can run back fast. Well done. Give yourself a clap. But actually, you're designed to go forward. My wife says that she's got eyes in the back of her head. I think she's got eyes everywhere. But every, but for most of us, I can say that she's downstairs. But for most of us, our eyes are in front of us and they're in front of us for a purpose. They're there in front of us to determine and direct our path as we go forward in life, not as we go back in life. Your eyes are there in front of you to see what is ahead of you, to catch a glimpse of the vision of what is ahead of you and to move forward. Praise God. That's how you're designed. That's how God has put us together. But as I look around the room, some of you have got the wonderful gift that I have, which is called glasses. I love them. This is the best thing since sliced loaf, I tell you. They're called varifocal glasses. Any very focal glasses wearers? Anybody? Put your hand up if you are. You're blessed. Hey, you're blessed in church today. If you're a very focal... I, I believe these are godly glasses. <laughs> I do. I believe this is how God intends all of us to be. 
very focal vision carriers, very focal vision livers. I believe that that's what God's intent for you and I is. It was what his intent with Abraham was. You see, one of the commonest, I guess, uh, ophthalmic problems that we can encounter is a condition called hypermetropia or hyperopia, I guess. It's long-sightedness. And long-sightedness is when the anatomical shape of your eye is short. And when the anatomical shape of your eye is short, then the image that you see is unable to, to land on your retina and it lands further back, as it were. The focal point brings it to further back in your eye. So you can't see things that are they're close up. They always remain blurry. When you're a young person with a hypermetropic eye, it doesn't matter because you've got such a flexible and wobbly lens in your eye, and that's able to contract and, ex and, and, and extend such that it allows the light to, to focus. But when you get to my age, that lens is a little bit stiffer, and it's not able to see. And so the reality is that you need help to see things that are close up because a hypermetropic person can see things in the distance but not things that are close up. I believe God has got a problem with hypermetropic Christians. And some of you are in here today. It's those kind of people who are always looking to the far away. They're always looking to the there and then. They're always looking to the by and by. What I'm going to do for God in the there and then. What I'm going to be for God in the distant future. What I'm going to accomplish for God when everything is fixed in my life. Whether it is my children are gone. Whether it is my mortgage is paid. Whether it is my finances are in order. Whether it is I've got more time for God. Whether it is I've got more energy. Whether it is that, that my education is complete. Whether it is when everything is fixed and sorted. Then I'll have time for God. People like that are always looking somewhere in the distance, dreamy and visionary for far away, but actually are unable to, to concentrate and focus, unable to have vision for right what is in front of them, unable to, to look at what God actually wants them to do right here, right now. What's God's plan for you today? What's God's plan for you this week? Oh, you may tell me, Ian, oh, when I'm, when I'm older, when the children are grown up, and don't worry, I'll be there and involved. Don't worry if there's a prayer meeting on, I'll be there every night because I won't be working the same. My mortgage will be paid. I won't have to give all my time and energies to something else. I'll be there in the distant future. And all the while, you miss what God has got for you right in front. And that's what hypermetropic Christians are. But some of you may not be long-sighted. Some of you may be short-sighted. And short-sightedness is called myopia. I'm sure you all knew that. Myopia is when the anatomy of the eyeball is that it's extended, it's longer. And when you have an extended eyeball, then of course the image it lands before it reaches the retina. And so you're unable to see things that are far away. You can see everything close up, but you're unable to see things that are far away. That which is in the distance is constantly blurred. And again, as a young person, then your lens will flex and it'll contract and allow you to, to compensate. But as you get older, you need wonderful varifocal lenses. You see, the reality is whether you're in the front row and messing about in the front row, I can see you. No messing about, Tom, because I can see you because these lenses help me to see you. Or whether you're in the back row, right at the very back, I can see you. You're sharp and focused. So no messing about in that back row because I can see what's going on right up at the very back. That's the wonder of varifocal lenses. They can give you close-up vision and they can give you far-away vision. A myopic problem, you see, is that we can see everything that's far away, but we can't actually see anything that's close up to us. The problem is that we, we're unable to have a vision or a focus or our attention of where we're going. We're unable to see what we're going to be or what we're going to become in the future. No, we don't have a, a sense of this is the woman that I want to be in five years or 10 years or 15 years. This is the man I'm becoming by the choices I'm making that's going to achieve and arrive at that particular place in 10 years' time. We don't do that if we're, got, if we're living a myopic Christian life because all we're able to focus on is the here and now. And for some of us, we've no sense of what a legacy is going to be because of the decisions that we're unable to take and we're consumed with here and now and not able to see. You see, failure is actually just a perspective. Some of us, we sang that song and I was caught in just that, and this is for somebody in here today, that we say that God has not failed ye, me, me yet. And some people in here actually think, well, Ian, he has failed me. He's let me down. Can I just give you a sense of why that may not be an accurate assessment. Because your failure is a perspective issue. It's not a moment issue. It's a perspective issue. 
Because when you've got long vision to see where your life is going to go, that which you do, which ends you up in a problem, is actually how God just shapes us and makes us and, and hones us to be who he's got us to be on the long view. The wonderful thing is, even though you have myopic Christian life, God doesn't. He sees the man or the woman you're becoming. Philippians 1, 6 that says, He who began a good work in you will complete it on the day that Jesus returns. Praise God. He's got very focal lenses. Hallelujah. So if you've got myopic Christianity or a myopic Christian life going on, then you're consumed with the here and now. You're consumed by your work. You're consumed by, by your children. You're consumed by your pleasure. You're consumed by yourself, I guess. And you lurch from one thing to the next, from one crisis to the next crisis. But I believe that God has got a, a call on your life and my life. It's a call to very focal living. Very focal living has got a picture of the far away of where God is taking you, of the man or the woman that God has destined and designed for you to be. And you've got a handle and you've sought him and you've prayed and you've called on his name and you've invited him to give you a reality and a direction of where is it that you want me to go, God? Who's the man or the woman that you've called me to be? Most of it is actually described in detail in here. All we need to do is read this and we'll find out who is the man or the woman that God has called us to be. But actually, God gives us that vision of the long view. But actually, he starts by saying, but there are things that I need you to do today, right here, right now, in 2018. And I, as we talked last week, the issue there was actually seeing the long view, seeing that God had a, long, a different location for your life. Could it be that your life is going to have a different location at the end of 2018? I'm not saying physically that you up sticks and move. But I'm saying, who, where will you be as an individual in 2018? Will you be living a different kind of life? Will you, be, will you be becoming a different kind of person? Will the priorities that you have at the moment be different priorities at the end of 2018? Where will the place of your location of life be? Will it be exactly as it was in 2017? Will you be exactly who you are now? Or is God taking you and shaping you to become a different man or a different woman at the end of 2018? There's a location. And I hope that all of us are trending new spiritual location in our lives. Lives. I'm, I'm, I've missed all the, the Instagrams this week. I've missed all the, the WhatsApps saying, who, hey, this is me trending a new location in my life. We should all be trending a brand new spiritual location because God doesn't want to leave us where we are. But actually it starts, as we're going to read in Abraham's life in a moment, with actually trending a brand new separation. The here and now, dealing with what he wants in our lives today, right now. So let's remind ourselves of this story. We're in, in Genesis chapter 11 and verse 31. If you've got a Bible, then let's turn to it. If you don't, don't worry. It'll be behind you on the screen. And we'll read a few verses in Genesis chapter 11 through Genesis chapter 12. Just to give us a context again of what God was saying to Abraham in this 75th year of his life. It says that Terah, his father, Abraham's father, took his son Abraham and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abraham, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan, where they came to Haran, and they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. The Lord had said to Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go into the land I will show you. I'll make you into a great nation, said God, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will, whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions that they'd accumulated, and all the people that they'd acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. I love this story. I think it's an amazing story and a wonderful inspiration for us to get a sense of what we should be trending in our lives in 2018. What should be the priorities of our lives? What should be getting our attention? It starts in verse chapter 12 and verse 1. It says, and the Lord said. I love how it starts. It starts actually by grace's intervention in Abraham's life. It starts by God, by his grace, identifying and speaking to this man. It wasn't about Abraham's merit. It was about God's mercy. It wasn't about anything that Abraham had done to deserve God speaking to him. It wasn't about anything that Abraham had accomplished in his life that, uh, that warranted God's attention. God gave him attention from a place of darkness. 
And I wanted to remind everyone in here today that no matter what's going on in your life, what has happened in your life, where you've come from in your life, what's the story of your life, all the issues of your life, what you could write on your, your CV of your life, God's grace is available for you today. And he looks at each one of us and he's for you and he's not against you. He speaks into your life no matter where you're at and what's going on in your life. You've maybe done some stuff even this last week that you're not proud of. You maybe once were on fire for God and now you know you're grown cold. Can I say to you again that it's grace's intervention by God today that is going to shift and change your life. It's not that you're going to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, turn a page over and a brand new leaf. It's not by the good things that you're going to do. It's not by the merit and giving more money. It's not by attending this or attending that. It's not by serving in a ministry. It's by God's amazing grace. Hallelujah. And grace intervenes into Abraham's life. But grace's intervention brings God's invitation into Abraham's life. You see, it was as well as a vision based on, on a, what God wanted for Abraham. It was also about the here and now. It was an invitation or at least a command from Abraham, from God to Abraham. You see, he says to Abraham, the Lord had said to Abraham, that's the grace bit. The Lord comes and intervenes, but he says these words, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. Many of us love the grace bit, don't we? We love the I will bless you bit. Everybody loves the, the bit that God is going to bless you and bless you and, and he's going to make your name great and he's going to extend you and expand you. If you're thinking, what does all that mean? I would encourage you to be here on the 28th. That's when we're going to unpack the blessing of God. And in the evening, we're going to try and, and put what God is saying to King's Community Church into practical realities for us. Where can we get involved and what is that going to look like? How can we pray? How can we give? What can we be engaged with? And in the evening, in the heart and soul night, we want to just unpack what I believe God is saying to us because he gives Abraham this sevenfold blessing. It's a blessing of expansion. He says, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to extend you. For everyone in this room, God's got a vision of expansion for your life that your life is going to be greater than it currently is. He's got a, a vision of addition. He says, I will bless you. I'm going to put benefit into your life. I'm going to put something into your life that is going to be good for you. Come on. Who's not keen for that? That God puts some blessing, something into your life that you know is going to be for your good and not for your ill. And he says, I'm going to make your name great. He's going to take, take and change your reputation, change your name. Hey, if you're not happy with Fred or Dinah or Bill or Bob, then you can maybe, you can change your name that way. But it's not about that. It's a change of a spiritual reputation. Who are you in Christ today? What is it that you're known as today? Are you known as a faithful one? Are you known as an infrequent one? Are you known as a, 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 a servant of God? Are you known as somebody who doesn't do anything? What are you known as today? I believe that God in 2018 is looking to take us individually and collectively and bring a brand new reputation into our lives. He's going to make your name great. He says, and you will be a blessing. I pray that in 2018, King's Community Church is going to be an amazing blessing for this city. And all of us will be part of that. I believe that your lives will be an amazing blessing to those in your family and your friends. And God has got something for each one of us, breakthrough for each one of us to take us from where we are, and that's where we're going. He says that he's going to not only that, there'll be wonderful associations that those that are in our lives, he's going to bless them. Come on, that's what we want, isn't it? The people around us, those that he blesses, bless us, then will be blessed. And then, of course, he says, I'm going to cover your back. Don't worry. Don't be afraid this year in 2018. King's Community Church, don't be afraid this year. Because people that curse you, I will curse. What does that mean? It means I've got your back. I'm for you and I'm not, I'm not against you. I'm for you. And then he says, and everybody, of course, that blessing of inclusion, that all the nations of the world will be blessed. There won't be anybody missed out. How wonderful that is, that it's everybody in our city Everybody in your world will be blessed because of what God puts into you. What a great picture of where we're going. What a great picture of what God has for you and for me. But you see, we love that. We love that I will bless. But most of us are not so excited about and so they separate from. We get excited about the grace statements of I will bless you. But it's not quite so keen to respond to the truth statements of get out from. You know, the word that he uses there means to go from, to get out of, to leave, to move, to actually die to, to separate from. And you know, the reality for us this year is when we want the I wills, we've got to realize that along with the I wills 
there is the separate from. And it's so important for all of us to get a handle today that God's short vision for us is a vision of separation. It's always been God's way and it always will be God's way. 2 Corinthians 6.17 says, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Don't touch what is unclean and I will receive you. All of us want to the I will receive you moment. But we've got to embrace the truth that says, Come out and be separate. I don't know where you're at and your, the burdens that you carry today, but I'm sure that you would love for God to say to you, I'll give you rest. I will give you rest. I will take your burdens from you. I will be there for you and lift the cares of the world from you. But you see, many of us want the grace statements of I will lift your burdens, but we're unwilling to respond to the truth. In the beginning of that verse in Matthew 11:20 20, says, Come to me, all you that are weary and heavy laden. I'm not saying that if you're burdened and you're, and you're weary that you don't go to your general practitioner and get some help and wisdom. I'm not saying that you don't go to friends and family and talk with them and say, hey, look, these are my burdens. I'm not saying that you don't share because a burden share is a burden half. And with the comfort that God has given us, I believe that's why we all together are there. That's what connect groups are about, so that you and I would comfort one another with the comfort that we've been given, that we would lift one another's burdens up. But above all things, you and I need to respond to the call that says, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, says God. All of us, I presume, want to be made into the fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. I will make you a disciple of Jesus, said God. I will make you a devoted follower of me, said Jesus. But he says again, come to me and I will make you. It's not go to the website where you'll find the podcast. It's not go to the social media site and you'll find great wisdom there. Go to the book on leadership and you'll find the realities there. No, it's not any of that. It's come to me. And I will make you fishers of men. I will make you fully devoted followers of Jesus. You see, there's always separation attached with new location. There's always a separation from where you are to the location where God wants to take you. And God is saying to Abram, Abram, I need you to trend the reality of separation this year. I need it to be a high trend in your life. I need it to be that which is a, gets high prominence and energy and time in your life. That's separation. If you and I want a brand new vision, if we want a fresh location, then it's going to take a fresh separation in our lives today. Sometimes it's not actually about Christian theology. It's almost about Christian mixology. And what do I mean by that? See, separation is not a, a common phrase that we talk about. It's not a popular concept. It's not something that we, we want to talk about because we live in this world where it's good to be kind of the same as everybody else and to, to live with everybody else and to be part of everybody else and to just go around, along with everybody else. But if we're going to talk separation and God is saying, it's not about Christian mixology. What do I mean by that? Well, some of us live our Christian lives as though we're in a solution. And you know what that is? It's when you put one thing in with another thing and and you dissolve one into another. But you see, if you get too much of one thing, then you can dissolve it so much that you can't actually taste what's in. You can put a little bit of salt in a glass of water, and you can drink it, and you can taste saltiness. But if you put too much water in there, the whole thing is, becomes so dissolved that you'll never taste anything. Some of our Christian lives are like that. We're so diluted by the environment and the culture and the conforming of the world that is around us, by the environment that we find ourselves in, we've got so much of that in our lives that there actually is no saltiness left to our life anymore, and we are living a Christian solution. Some of us are not like that. Some of us are maybe like an emulsion where at least you know there is a little bit of oil perhaps and a little bit of water. I like a little bit of salad dressing on my life too, like most of you on my salad. Sorry, not my life, but on my, on my salad like you do. But you know when you look at a salad dressing, it's partly oil and partly water. And you think, well, you can see that there's two separate parts there in an emulsion, isn't there? But you see what happens is before I can utilize my salad dressing, I need to shake it. And when I shake it, it becomes one thing and you pour it out. It's the same with us. Some of us are living as a Christian emulsion in our lives. Yes, we can identify as separate, but when agitation comes, when the shaking of life comes, our responses don't tell any difference between who we are. We just are shaken up and we respond in exactly the way as the world responds. If somebody gives us a, a comment that we don't like and we, we get hurt, we pick up our football and we don't play anymore. 
If we, somebody says something, it is not a nice comment, then we, we, we live, we respond with negativity. It's exactly the same as the world is. If something happens in our life, we go telling this person, we go telling that person, we go telling the next person. It's exactly what the world does. And we say, I'm not playing the game anymore. I've been hurt, I've been wounded. That's Christian emulsion, that's, that's wrong mixology. Some, I guess, are maybe like the best, which is maybe like a suspension where you've got some one particle inside another particle. But even there, you might have the distinctiveness in the environment which you're in. But if you take an aerosol which has got some stuff inside it and a spray, all it needs to be is pressed and it's one thing it emerges. For some of us, it's when we get that pressure in our lives that that which is supposed to be separate doesn't come out and we just come out exactly like the world would come out. Well, you and I are called to a different life. You and I are called to a life of separation. The Christian life is not an easy life. It's not a life of simple mixology. It's a life of separation. And you and I need to trend in 2018, separation. And what does God say to Abraham? Abraham, I need you to separate from. I need you to separate from your country. I need you to separate from your, your people. And I need you to separate from your father's house. And what was he saying there? Well, he was saying, I need you to separate from your country. What is that about? Your country is that which gives you identity. It's that which determines this is who you are. This is where you belong. This is what your background is. This is what your, your, your character is. And this is where you've come from. And for many of us in here today, the challenge is about our identity. And God, I believe, is saying to some in here this morning, it's time to separate from the identity that's been yours all your life. The identity that somebody has given you. You know, I've got a passport in my pocket here. It's my well-worn passport. And inside there are so many stamps. I've got stamps from a Laos in Thailand. I've got Thailand. I've got Laos. I've got Australia. I've got India. I've got stamps here from the USA. I've got a stamp here from Montenegro. I've got a stamp here from, where else? Turkey, Istanbul. I wish my kids had all married Scots rather than these stamps from all over the world. That would have been easier, wouldn't it? But the reality is, this passport has been issued to me. It states who I am. I know you're thinking, who's that convict on here? It is me. <laughs> but it says I'm British. I've got stamps from all over the world, but it says I'm British. My identity is British. I may have visited and gone to other places, but I'm British. Because it's been told to me that I'm British. I've been born in a British town. So it tells me where I was born. It tells me what day I was born. You see, sometimes we treat our identity like this. Somebody has told you who you are. Somebody has told you from where you came and you're not going to be any different. Somebody has told you that the passport, as it were, of your life is going to determine your identity forever. And God is saying today, I need you to separate from that identity. For, for Abraham, it was to separate from the place of his birth, a place where idolatry was rife, a place where God's name was not mentioned high, a place, <coughs> excuse me, where idolatry was the order of the day. And I don't know what your identity is today, but identity crisis is everywhere for us. And we know that it's so important in life that people are, are now fighting country against country, nation against nation. A, a, a particularly tall, blonde-haired American this last week didn't do his country any favors. It wasn't my son-in-law either. But this tall, blonde-haired American, he said some things against all of Africa and all of Haiti, and I think he didn't do himself any favors. Because identity is important to you and I. But what is your identity today? What are you known as today? What have people said to, about you? Have they said that you're a loser, you're born a loser, and you're always going to be a loser? Are you from a loser's family, a family that has always failed? Are you from a, a background that has got brokenness, and so your brokenness will continue? Are you from a, a, a situation that says, it's always been difficult in my family line, so it's always going to be difficult? Our background, our nation, my identity determines where my destiny is. Today, I want to say to you that it's time to separate from your country. To Not physically, I'm not saying give up your passport. You're welcome to do that and get a Scottish passport, all of you. I'd love you to do that. But no, he's not saying that, but he is saying spiritually, it's time to refresh your identity. Bible says that we are brand new creations, born once again by the Spirit of God, never to be the same again. So what do we do, Paul says to Rome? Do we continue sinning in that place where our identity is? Do we continue that life that we've had before so God has to keep on forgiving? He says, I hope not. 
If we've left the country where sin is sovereign, where that was where our identity was, how can we still live in our old house there? Didn't you realize that we packed up and left there for good? That's what happens in baptism. When you go under the water, you leave the old country of sin behind. And when you come up out of the water, you enter a brand new country of grace, a new life in a new land. Hallelujah. See, in God's economy, there is no national identity. And we get so caught up sometimes with national identity, but it's very clear there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's your identity. You're one of Abraham's children, a king of ki the son of the king of kings and the Lord of lords. What is your identity today? Maybe for you it's that reality, I, I need to shift my identity and move into where God has called me, his son, his daughter, a joint heir with Christ. You see, for us in here today, this is only a temporary travel document. It only allows us to go from country to country here on earth. But you and I are citizens of, of heaven. You and I are citizens of that place in heaven where Abraham was looking forward to going. That's where you and I are. That's where our passport is. That's where our, our identity should be in heaven, not here on earth. We are children of the King of Kings, joint ears with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You're ready to inherit his kingdom. That's who God has said is your identity. He says, I need you to leave your country. I need you to leave your people. I need you to leave the surroundings and the influence and the culture and the mindsets and the thinking of the people that are around you. When Abraham left, he not only left the region, but he left the religion. He left his relatives and he left all the, the realities that were his and the rules that were his of where he was living. You see, today it's the challenge for you and for me of conformity. What are you conforming to in your mind? What is the thinking that goes on in your heart? Where is your thinking taking you today? Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinks, so is he in his heart. The actions that you take start in your mind the way you think, and the way you think is determined sometimes by the culture in which you live, by the voices that are around you, and by the pressures in your life. Where are they coming from? How do you think today? What is your thinking coming from? how you think through the issues and the challenges of your life. Where's those thoughts coming from? Are you thinking biblically as God would have you think? Or are you thinking how you want to think? What about your sex life? Where are the thoughts that are determining that? When you sleep here and you sleep there and you watch this and you watch that, is that thoughts generated by God? When you're doing stuff on the internet and thinking about what you're going to do next, are those thoughts determined by what God wants you to do? When you're living a double life and thinking you're going to get away with it, that nobody's actually seeing you, God is seeing you. But when you're thinking that kind of stuff, where's those thoughts coming from? Where's that pressure coming from to live a life like that? What about your generosity? Where's your thoughts about how generous you're going to be? Where's that thought coming from? When your pockets are all stitched up and you're your wallet has got a lock and key. Where does that thinking and behavior come from? Where is that determined by? Because as a man thinks, so he is. What about your flexibility, what you allow and permit into your life? Is your thought life totally determined by you and by what you want to do and how you want to live? You know, I was telling the first service about a story that I heard within the life of the church. There was a wedding quite a few months ago and as they came to the celebration time, the uh, people gathered on a table and everybody was ordering alcohol and, and they all the Christians gathered around and had all the alcohol on the table. And you know where I'm at, I'm, I'm teetotal for a variety of reasons, but I can't, I'm not saying from this platform, you must be teetotal, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, what's your thinking? And why, is your thinking solely to determine what you want to do in your life? and how you want to live your life. You see that table of people who are knocking back alcohol with no problem because they were free to do that. Into that table sat somebody who just emerged from a history of alcoholism, who just emerged from a difficulty with trying to get God to control the challenges of alcohol in her life. And she sat at that table and for the next several hours panicked that she was gonna fall panicked because she didn't know would God come through with enough strength for her in her life to manage that difficulty. 
The people on the table didn't know. But you see, sometimes if we don't think biblically, you see, thinking biblically means I need to consider the weaker brother all the time. I need to consider people around me all the time. I need to consider the company I keep. I need to consider who I'm with, and I need to consider where I'm with, and I need to consider what the influence of my life is going to be. I need to consider all that because when we do that, that's thinking biblically. And as we think biblically, then we'll act biblically. And God says to you and me at the start of 2018, it's time to trend separation, not only in our behavior, but in our thinking. And all of you know Romans 12 and 1, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Think differently this year in 2018. Think of the weaker person who may be in your company. Think differently. And finally, you see, he says, I want you to not only leave your country, your identity. I not only want you to leave the conformity to the systems of the world around you. He says, I want you to leave your father's house. It's the voice of authority. I want you to leave the voice of authority. And the question for Abraham was, yeah, that's my father's voice. He's got the last word in my life. He determines where we go. It's no secret in the chapter 11. It says, Terah took Abraham and all the rest of the entourage and went to Haran. It was Terah's voice who determined where they went. It was Terah's voice that determined where they stopped. Who's determining your starts and your stops today? Is it social media? Is it your Facebook friends? Is it your husband or your wife? Is it yourself? Who's the determining the final voice in your life today? Oh, that it would be God's voice. You see, Romans says it's by faith comes, faith or belief comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the Word of God, the voice that you listen to. Our identity, what we believe about ourselves, comes through what we think, what we understand, through our conformity, by the voice that you and I listen to, the voice of authority. Today I pray that God has got the voice of authority into your life. Because God says to Abraham, go. And I love when it says, and he went. And he went. And God says to every one of us in this room today, it's time to go. It's time to get up. It's time to head for that brand new location that I've got. It's time to move from where you are. It's time to get up from where you are. It's time to separate from where you are. It's time to separate from the old identity, the old you. It's time to... Separate from that conforming to everybody else's opinion around you. It's time to separate from that final voice of authority that's deep within. It says, I'm going to live my life. I'm going to determine how I'm going to do my life. I'm going to determine what my life is going to be. And it's time to say, yes, Jesus, you are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. I trust as we go into 2018 that we trend as well as brand new location for our spiritual lives. We trend a brand new separation for our lives. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Close our eyes just for a moment of privacy. Just for a moment where we can think for ourselves and not be thinking about that which is going on around us. You know, in this place today, I'm quite sure there are people who continue to live in that old identity. Living in that place of brokenness, living in that place of insecurity, trying to find identity. Even in this moment, in this hallowed moment, still texting, listening, WhatsApping, is it not an important moment to you? Is it not that God wants to speak to you right here, right now? Oh, God's heart is breaking for every one of us in this room, for all of us in this room today. God's calling all of us to separate Separate from our past, from that which is around us, from the voice of authority in our heads, and get to that place where we listen to his voice. Father, I thank you today. I pray your blessing upon this wonderful group of men and women. Lord, for every single one of us, we get to that place, Lord, where we respond to you, that it's your voice we hear. It's your voice that says, I want you to leave where you're going and go. God, that we would respond to you in every way. In Jesus' name, amen.